Sorry, Ron. It's kind of hard to get volume out of it when the pastor doesn't turn the little switch on. Brianna, welcome back. Uh, are you the only Haiti traveler here tonight? Any other Haiti travelers raise your hand? I think they're all pretty worn out. It's a long trip. Uh, kudos to you, Brianna Hill. Uh, you're a strong woman like your mother, uh, and we love you. And we're so glad that you guys are all back and praying for uh, uh, Owen that he uh, beats that you know, poison ivy that he's fighting uh, the terrible thing that happened. Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to start at verse 19 in just a minute. And I'm talking tonight on public worship and what it's about, the importance of it, and what needs to be taking place. While you're turning to Hebrews chapter 10, let me remind you a few weeks ago on a Sunday night, I spoke on Holy Spirit sensitivity. And I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell, and this, this should help you. I hope you really hear this loud and clear. All right? We are all broken in every area until Jesus changes us, reveals light, sheds his word, and changes our hearts to be different in every area as God wants us to be. So that has to do with the tongue. It has to do with motive. It has to do with sensuality. It has to do with, uh, uh, you know, uh, issues of pride, which has to do with jealousy and envy and all those things. All those things, we're born sinners, and by nature, we're selfish, and by nature, we're, we aren't going to function properly with the things God has given us. So here's, here's a sentence I want to remind you of. And, and I, I, would, I would ask you perhaps to encourage people to watch this online later, but to, I, I, just want, I just want you to hear this loud and clear. The Holy Spirit gifts always reach out toward others in kindness, in gentleness, in patience, in love, in forgiveness, in grace, in all of those things, okay? And so as you function, talking about Holy Spirit sensitivity, as you function dealing with others, don't use the excuse that I did many years until the Lord showed me that by nature you're just, you just don't get sensitivity. Because the Holy Spirit can help you learn as you are relating out to others to be sensitive to others so that the Holy Spirit will guide you and help you in spite of your natural tendency, which is sometimes to be a rusty old saw like me, you know, to be learn that Holy Spirit sensitivity, preferring one another, being kind to each other, uh, being compassionate toward one another, all those things that are absolute God traits. But, so there's one way that you can be wrong with spiritual sensitivity, and that's how you relate to others and being insensitive. But it's just as wrong to be oversensitive to yourself. And Holy Spirit sensitivity is to be dead. You can't hurt a dead person. When things come at you, don't take up offense easily. Let things go. Don't assume everyone has an ulterior motive or they were intending to hurt your feelings. Don't assume when two or three people are talking here and you normally say hello to them and they're not talking to you, don't assume they're shutting you out because someone could have just had their father die and they're close to these people and they're sharing and these people are exhorting them and they're in a conversation you just don't happen to be in. So let me just say to you, if you're oversensitive, that's just as sinful as being insensitive. If you're oversensitive toward yourself, that's wrong. And if you're insensitive toward others, that's wrong. My problem and my human natural tendency is to be insensitive to others, which makes me very hard to hurt because I'm also insensitive. So it's easy for me not to take up offense. What's difficult for me is let the Holy Spirit make me sensitive to others. But some of you are just in reverse. It's easy for you to be sensitive towards others, but towards yourself, you're way oversensitive and you need to get over yourself and realize you're dead. You can't hurt a dead man. Are you with me? That's good stuff right there. That's, that's, that's worth coming tonight. Okay, so I already preached on that once, but I wanted to re reemphasize that very, that very thing. Because quite honestly, I'm tired of trying to pastor uh, people that get hurt about every little thing by everybody else. Quit getting hurt so easy. It's okay. Let things go. Don't be so easily offended. 
And if you get offended, don't spread it. Bitterness spreads. Don't be talking about it. Let it go. It's, it, I can't, you can't help the offense, but just pray and give it to God and move on. You know? Pastor, you always say, just forgive, just forgive. Yeah, exactly. Just forgive. Just forgive. Exactly. Just forgive. That's exactly it. Just forgive. And then forget and move on. Now, tonight's message. That was just meddling a little bit from something that the Holy Spirit wanted me to share with you. So that doesn't mean for you that are sensitive that I'm looking at you and thinking about you because I don't even know who's here without looking. Okay? Brian, you can be sensitive, but you learned to balance that, you know, over the years we worked together. And you, you don't take things wrong anymore because you're, you're, you've learned to be tough. Your gift of sensitivity is beautiful and you've learned not to be oversensitive towards yourself. Pastor Brian's awesome. All right, importance of public worship. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. This is not on the screen, so you may have to use your Bible or your electronic device. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, this house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching, meaning the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord, the day of his coming of judgment. Let us consider, verse 24, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. Spur one another, encourage. That is why we come together, and it's important. We're not made to be, indivi- uh, made to be people uh, just to be an island or be alone. We need, God knew that we weren't made to just be alone. And one of the things worshiping Jesus together does, and it's so important, is uh, it it rekindles our spiritual fire. And there's nothing like coming together. It keeps our fire burning. Uh, corporate worship brings together God's word and prayer and fellowship and, and testimony and, and many other teachings so that it makes for the, the greatest means of ongoing grace in our Christian faith and our walk, getting coming together. But you can't think of worship as a means that can be dangerous. See, some people are so, we, we think of, a, of worship as a means to do something, as opposed to pure heart just worshiping God, and he shows up. Do you see what I'm talking about? When you come to God to worship him, don't think, even though, it, even it tells us in the word here the importance of coming together, don't think of worship as a means to something in your heart, or else you're kind of manipulating, trying to make something happen for yourself, just how pure tender, sweet worship and love for, love for God and lo- love for each other. And, um, and so when we come together to worship and we're here together, we got to be careful that it's, it's the experience of the heart that matters and not anything else. And so many times we become church service, public worship service experts. And we miss God because we evaluate everything from the style of the minister, the teaching style, personality, song selection, balance of instrumentation, how it has instrumentation, and we evaluate everything from lights to everything else, and we miss God because we're about the church service, and it's about the God that the church should be about. So that's what I'm talking about. So you, 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 can me, you can mess up. I picked the songs today, tonight. You like the songs I picked? I picked them because I wanted to sing them. Okay? And so it's, it's okay. And, and uh, my son picked the morning, and, and, and I think it was a great set, and I love every one of those songs. Uh, you know, new songs are good, but old songs aren't bad. You know, and, and so there's, I, I, lo- I love that. And it's okay, but if you're sitting here going, when we're singing these songs, and you're by, we say, that's old, that's old, that's old. 
You know, well, you're missing God. That's my point. Or, you know, Pastor Zach, he's got a certain style about him. Isn't he a good preacher? He's a good preacher. By the way, sometimes the pastors aren't here. If, I, if they're not, I, I know it. Pastor Zach called me because he'd been at camp all week and he worked on a sermon all day yesterday and hadn't been with his family. He said, could I stay home from church and be with my family? I said, sure you can. And don't you get judgmental because you do it too. Some of you are already there right now. But anyway, you know, we can, we can be like worship service, public service experts and we miss God. You know what I'm talking about? Just come in with a simple heart and go after God. And one of the most important things of public worship is awakening. Sometimes in ourselves, we can get in a spiritual fog, just a sense of spiritual fog. I do it, I know you do it, I know for certain you do. Scripture, what I just read, even implies it. And, and I want you to, to turn over to Psalm uh, 73 here in a moment. If you get your Bibles ready for that. But to awaken our hearts is, uh, is number one. Uh, you know, there can be a rough, uh, difficult, weak, hard knocks of real life, where they disorient us, you know, uh, and, and, and we, sometimes we, don't, we, we lose focus of what's really important, and we need to clear our head, refresh our spirit, renew our heart. Martin Luther said this. He said that he found corporate worship to be powerful in awakening his spiritual fire. Quote, at home in my house, there's no warmth or vigor in me, but in the church, when the multitudes gather together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. How many appreciate coming together and singing songs? We sing together, we encourage, we worship. It's a blessing, it lifts us up. Turn with me to Psalm 73, we're gonna start in verse two. It says, well, I'll just start uh, at verse one. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who appear in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold. You ever felt like that? For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I know people feel like that. I've heard them tell me. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Their pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Verse nine, their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. He's talking about how, he, how he's feeling. And then he said, if I had said, I will speak thus, uh, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Look at this, verse 17, until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Fog clears as he comes conscious in the presence of God. In the presence of God, the spirit of the God, he speaks and he makes things clear. And until that moment in the world, he was in a fog and he was looking at everyone in the world and he was discouraged and it looked like everyone else that didn't follow God, that was the way to go. That was the blessed life until he got in the presence of God and God awakened him and his eyes could see. Verse number uh, uh, 16, reading on, it says, uh, or verse number 18 rather, surely your place, you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. Oh, how he changes quickly when he enters in the sanctuary. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O oh Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Verse 21, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. Verse 24, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into glory. Look at verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord sovereign, so, sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell, tell of all your deeds. He's saying that when I come in the presence of God, when I turn to you, 
That's when I find the new perspective. That's when I find strength. And, I, I, uh, and, and, and he was at the end talking about how he knows he needs to be near to God. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever, verse 26 says. So how many times have we found it to be true? We do indeed. And again, verse 28, for, it, for me it is good to be near God. We come to public worship, we come together to enter into his presence together. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of you. And there's encouragement and we build each other up just in the singing of songs and declaring God's word. The second thing, not only is there awakening, but there's community. There's a community dynamic, that's why he even calls it the church. Ecclesi, Ecclesi, uh, Ecclesia, the, the community, that's, that's who we are. And so many times we make church just about a sermon and just about a, a song. But we don't come to have church, we come to be the church. We come to be the church. We come to pray with each other, encourage each other. And in, in, in this dynamic of being a, in a community, and the next point is growth and encouragement, they kind of go together, is that testimonies, sharing what God has done, using the gifts of the Spirit biblically, like a word of knowledge, something that God reveals to you that you wouldn't otherwise know that you're able to go and talk with someone. So many times we've made the the, the gifts of the Spirit that that are listed in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, we made them really weird. We have, we've made them weird. And um, it's almost like we play uh, like a Holy Spirit seance. We kind of do things in really weird way. Or like even in giving a prophecy, and I don't see this in the New Testament. I, I see it in the Old Testament, but remember the Old Testament's different. Like Moses, God spoke through him, and he would say, God has said this. But let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit's in all of us. So when God speaks forth a word for the congregation, a word of exhortation, a prophetic word of encouragement, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it says for exhortation, for edification, for, for comfort, right? The gifts are all for that. Sometimes we say, I am the Lord thy God. I say this. And, you know, someone in our midst goes, you're God? They don't understand that. When it might be better to word that just a little bit different, wouldn't it? The Lord, the, the Lord is impressing upon me today this thought, this truth, you know, and share that. Or in our size sanctuary, you know, sometimes we're in here on a Sunday morning in places full of worship in God, and suddenly someone is speaking, and to be heard, they have to be really loud. And the people over here still don't hear them, and the people right around them, it scares them, makes the hair stand up on the back of their neck, Right? So I've been praying about how do we resolve that? And I thought, well, if I go, if you have a word, you feel like you have a word, if you come down the front and we see you, we'll come down and give you a mic so everyone can hear it, you don't have to yell. But then I think, but people will be critical going, you're trying to control the work of the Spirit. No, I'm just trying to make the work of the Spirit heard. Right? Because it's just common sense. Let all things be done decent and in order, right? But when we come together, if we will be spiritually minded and and be a community, God's spirit gifts are meant to minister one to another. Like the Holy Spirit, you tap into it, there's the gift of healing, that we would pray for one another and see people healed. I don't remember who prayed for me, but but I don't feel sick tonight. I don't remember, someone prayed for me this morning. I know it was after church, Jeremy and Tina. They just grabbed me and prayed for me. The missionaries, Lori's daughter. And I felt the, when she put her hand on my back where I've been hurting so bad, I just felt the power of God hit me. See, that's what, that's what community is. And then when I tell you about it, that's the way you should do is to give a good report, right? And so as, as a church, sometimes we only sing and only have a sermon and we give an invitation just for a moment but we, we might need to do some things differently. I, I, I love Sunday night church and I appreciate y'all coming. Father's Day and Mother's Day are always because, pe- I understand that I'm not, criti- not criticizing you if you're watching. Okay, I understand it because family, that, I understand it, but listen to me. I preach on those nights because I don't really want any other staff because I'm tough and I don't care if I'm only preaching the Darrell Weaver. I told him that earlier. 
If you're the only one, Darl always shows up. Darl, if you're the only one, I'm preaching to you, bro. I'm gonna preach until your hair falls out so I'll feel better about myself. We're a community, aren't we? We're, we're brothers in Christ. Do you remember, you remember even Elijah? You know, in, in Elijah's day, it was a godless generation, and yet God found and pointed out 7,000 who hadn't abandoned the truth. Even Elijah needed community. He needed other people to encourage and to support. You've heard the old illustration, but I just got to say it, is that you'd like you have a fire and you have the logs all together and the fire keeps going. But if you pull every log separately, they'll all go out a lot quicker. But if they come together, they'll, they'll, they'll burn on each other and they encourage and they set a fire. So it's important to be community, guys. It's very important that you pick up and do what God has given you to do. When we talk about the next thing, growth and encouragement, I've got to say that we're all responsible for that, okay? And as a pastor, I'm responsible for that. Pastors uh, want to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to help you be fulfilled, right? Pastors pray for people. Pastors uh, let the Holy Spirit help them encourage and be an ear. Pastors look for people that are discouraged away from God to encourage them. We do this thing, right? But but not everyone that's paid, there, there are people that have a pastoral gifting that aren't paid. We have them in this place, like Kirk Weaver over there. He, he, he just has it. Ask any of the junior hires, ask Pastor Zach, he's got it. So it's just, it's just a gift from God, right? But here's what a pastor is not. He's not a babysitter. A pastor shouldn't have to have people that you come to church four or five times and you miss once and they don't check on you for the person to be offended or angry because you didn't check on them. In fact, really, if you turn it around as a body, you should be telling us, hey, I'm going to be gone. I asked that a while back. How about letting us know? By the way, I pretty well notice, I can't remember the new people's names because I don't get it, but my old memory is still good. I remember y'all. Right? I knew, I, I, it takes me about seven times now to get a new person's name down. <laughs> I do remember one person from this morning though, uh, a friend of Diana's came and I, I still remember, I can see her face and I won't forget her for whatever reason. Uh, but uh, uh, she works over at our church at the, uh, the polling booth and she came and she really liked it. And she has a, a very traditional background uh, in church, but she really liked the church that she'd be back. You know, sometimes we, we, we make what we do as a church pretty America religion, religious. It's not really what God really wants us to be. So we, we need to re remember this, that we are here to encourage each other to grow, to accomplish what Paul was writing about in Romans 8, where he said, verse 29, for those whom God foreknew, he also predetermined or predestined, it really means predetermined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's his will, that we all be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Corporate worship in general is upbuilding, encouraging, consolation, 1 Corinthians, 4, 4, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, but also in the part of our sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, looking more like Jesus, and helping, iron sharpening iron. And I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't, listen, I, I think when we're in relationship with each other, we don't, just, we don't just go, I got my feelings hurt and I'm ducking tail and I'm running. Because we're in relationship with each other and you mature by being iron upon iron. You're mature by someone that has a bad moment and needs forgiveness by forgiving them. You see what I'm talking about? And by the way, can I just tell you, I said it again, a great church isn't the church that has the best preacher or the best music. A great church is the people that is the church that has the great, the best people. All right, do you hear that? It's not the one that has the greatest preachers or the greatest music. It's the church that has the greatest people. And I personally am very prejudiced and defensive for you. I believe you're great people. And I tell people that this is where I would go even if I didn't start it and don't pastor it. These people are phenomenal. They are compassionate. They're not prejudiced. 
They're not elitist. They're not sexist. They're not mean. They're loving. They're kind. They're not age prejudiced. They're, they give to missions. They live out their life. They're sincere about their walk with God. That's what I believe. Now, are all of you consistently all of that? Maybe not. But you can ask Mary back there, Mother Mary of New Hope, who helps us in the office part time. She will tell you, I say all the time, the greatest people in the world that I, I believe are right here in this church. And I'm looking at some of you. But I'm just trying to, to restructure, to help us to know that as the people of God and people that love God and come out on a Sunday night on a Father's Day, you're able to be here. You know, be the, just, I mean, be the church. I've always said, I was always worried about having a, a prayer team that's kind of official or whatever, because then the people that would pray don't come. Please hear me. Please get down here and pray with people. Anytime the Holy Spirit, you see someone, you're in relationship. You sh if you're in relationship with a person that comes down for prayer, you should be buzzing out of your seat. Because that's what a church is, community, it's relationship. Are you with me? Okay, I'm not, I'm not talking down to you. I love you. Uh, but, you know, we, we, you know, the thing is, is Christian growth is not just something we take as a sermon application and then work into our lives that week. That's what, like Luke talked about a few weeks ago. There are times, may, and may God make them many times, when the Holy Spirit takes the scriptures read, the sermon spoken, the prayer prayed, the chorus sung, the hymn sung, the truth preached, and presses it right to the point of our need, and doesn't just inform us here, but heals us in that moment on the inside. And was joined, when we're joined in corporate worship, God loves not only to change our minds, but also irrevocably change our hearts on the spot. And when I've been in church, the things that have happened that are the earmarked things have happened in corporate worship. Are you with me? Anybody else could raise your hand and say, that's me too? My salvation, my infilling of the Holy Spirit, healings, encouragements, things uh, 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 that were supernatural words from God. The next thing is learning to pray and worship from others. Number four, not only awakening and community and growth and encouragement, but, but learning to pray and worship from others. In other words, you know, I think it's good that we come around here and the people that pray, go ahead and pray and pray out loud. Because the way I learned to pray was listening to old sister, Brother Smith pray in First Assembly in Waco, Texas. You know, listening you know, to some of the saints of old and get a hold of the horns of God and begin to cry out to God. And we, when we're in community, we learn how to pray by hearing others pray and praying together with them. Secondly, we also learn to worship by being around other people that worship. You can just sing a song or you can get into worship in a spiritual realm that is beyond yourself where you're lost in the presence of God. And oh, how I, le I yearn for those times. And so we need to, we need to uh, understand the important distinction of public worship and private worship. Now, let me tell you, in private worship, you're in charge of where you go when you're alone, what scripture you read, what prayers you pray, if you put on music, what music you put on. But someone else is in charge of public worship. Someone else is in charge of how, where we're going. And that's a good thing so that we can be together and it's not in disarray or, 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 or out of, uh, of uh, uh, order. We need, we need to come together. And corporate worship demands the discipline ourselves to respond and pursue God not just on our own terms, but embrace being led and, and, and not always taking the lead privately. So I believe there's great value in public worship. And, and finally, the shared experiences that we have and the inspiration. I mean, who, 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 who could hardly forget Louis Stromberg's testimony stand, sitting right back there? when the doctor said, you'll never see again, your eye won't ever clear up. And God healed her. She said, I don't believe that. Right? <clears throat> and also, there is a heightened experience of worship. 
When I watched that passion video for the college students that they're gonna have in Dallas with Louis Giglio, one of the greatest communicators to walk the face of the earth gonna be there. And anybody, you know, you know college students that aren't saved, you know college students that go, I wanna make sure we use every one of those tickets and we'll get them there, we're gonna fill that bus up and get, get them to that passion conference. But when they're gonna have 35, 40,000 students in a huge arena in Dallas of college students, and they're lifting their voice and they're worshiping, there's something about those moments. And Mariah, you know at Evangel, when you have even the number that's there and you're there in a, in a corporate worship service, it is very encouraging. You know, our own adoration is increased, our own awe is accentuated when we come in the context of corporate worship. Our joy is doubled. Our worship to Jesus is, is impacted greatly when we do it together. And together we can experience a deeper, a richer, a greater adoration, a greater awe, since our delight in Jesus will absolutely expand and magnify as we worship together the Lord Jesus Christ. The secret of joy in corporate worship is the happy awareness that we're not alone, having our souls satisfied in Him, but seeing others blessed of faith and also of joy, and remembering that all around the city there's other people that are sincere worshiping God and in other nations, all races, tribes, people that are worshiping God in all languages and we're a forever family. It encourages us. If I just, as a pastor, as long as I've walked with God, if I just quit coming to church, it wouldn't take me real long to really dry up. So let's be the church.